On Commodity Champions, we are now joined by Mr. Vikas Singh. He's MD, MMTC, PAM. Vikas, thank you so much for joining us. And as we've been saying, that gold clearly is in the limelight. We've seen returns being stronger. We've seen people inculcate it in various ways into their portfolios. So whether it's physical via uh, sovereign gold bonds, where also we have seen 100 tons being collected by now. And then digital gold clearly stands up because the ticket size is small and there are more and more people joining in now. Uh, and, uh, uh, firstly, thank you, Manisha, for having me on the show. Um, uh, it's very interesting. I think, you know, there have been some milestone moments which have made a huge difference in the way people engage with gold. We know, uh, you know, I say this often, uh, India's relationship with gold is almost a divine relationship. It goes back, you know, you know generations. It goes back a million years. Um, Post-COVID, people have been very careful in terms of, you know, how they make their investments. There have been formal recommendations that now maybe precious metals, gold and silver, should account for maybe a 5 or 10 percent of portfolio, depending upon oh, who's... higher numbers than yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm being conservative. I don't want to overstate it. So I'm just being, you know, as hopefully realistic as possible. The second is now, if you see the financial shocks which are coming in, you know, uh, one would not have expected, uh, you know, the financial uh, segment to undergo the kind of turmoil that you're seeing. Uh, Long-term bonds, uh, yield rates which used to be high have actually come down and that is leading to a cascading so-called domino effect and, you know, and obviously the focus is turning to gold and silver. If you actually see silver is doing a similar run. So um, if you were to therefore see uh, from an efficiency of your portfolio and how do you manage it, uh, very clearly this is a product or these are, you know, asset classes that one should be participating in. One last word here is uh, even governments are investing. So central banks very clearly are taking reserves up and that in a way is an endorsement of what you know, the investment is all about. Mm -hmm. Tell us on how much of growth have we seen in digital gold buying in India and what geographies do you see doing better? So digital gold, uh, by and large, uh, it's, a, it's a high double digit uh, number. Uh, we are actually seeing it across geographies and across town classes. Um, given India's uh, digital literacy, just about everyone is very, very conversant on the phone, so this is definitely not a barrier. Uh, you know, I think the larger piece is awareness uh, in terms of people knowing it and engaging with it. Uh, the area that we are actually concerned about is lack of a regulator. If we can bring in a regulator, a formal regulator, and ensure that this in a way secures and safeguards the interest of the investors, and in this case what we call micro-investors, because these are people who buy 500, 600, 700 rupees, I think then you're setting up the ground really well for financialization of gold and feeding in into the spot exchange as and when it gets launched. So when you talk about regulations, what is the conversation like with the regulators or various departments as of now? So these are recommendations that we made. Uh, we are hoping they're being considered. And uh, you know, at this point in time, I don't have much information, but I'm assuming that these are you know, hopefully under consideration and should go live. Uh, we are hoping. Yes. <laughs> All right, we're hoping too. <laughs> That's about digital gold. But refining is another thing, and MMTC PAM clearly has taken a lead into this. Where do the numbers stand right now, especially with so many more players now coming into the market? What is the overall working capacity? What is the kind of competition that you're dealing with? So, uh, given the portfolio that we have, uh, Manisha, with an LVM accreditation, in a way we maintain that from a competition point of view, we really don't, you know, acknowledge what's out there. Um, our recommendation, once again, uh, remains that uh, the opportunity for India is really addressing the global markets. Uh, you know, India, for example, uh, if you see, given the volatility of the markets now and therefore also the category, uh, um, the, the, the valuation of the product really varies. So, for example, suppose India's at a discount, your markets in the world which are actually at a premium. And if one can tap these opportunities, build liquidity, bring in foreign exchange, I would believe this would be a significant contributor to the bottom line from an India point of view, leave aside the company point of view. Uh, we have the technology, we have the expertise, we have the craftsmanship, we have the marketing skills, we have the network. So, you know, uh, here again is another hoping that things happen and we look forward to the government hopefully responding on this. So what, what's your sense on the good delivery part here, whether it is about on the exchanges, there was a conversation about doing it on IBX as well. So, uh, well, yes, so uh, India Good Delivery and LBMA, uh, both are standards which have been accepted. And I think once again, from a point of view of, you know, securitization of investors, so I think that's, these are obviously minimum, basic minimum must-haves from a point of view of investments that are being made. 
On Commodity Champions, we have now with us Mr. Priya Som Sundaram. He is from World Gold Council. Som, hi, always a pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, what a quarter this has been where gold seems to be outperforming almost every other asset yes. class. But what's your sense with the prices rising high and as the industry has been giving a feedback that the buying clearly has gone down. So what is it that you see in sense of prices and Indian demand? You see, the price going up is something consumers always expect. In fact, I buy gold. I bought gold last year because I thought prices will go up. So that is actually performing its role. The issue comes when prices are volatile. If I go and buy today at 62 and next week I find it is at 60,000, I'm going to feel very disappointed. So when there is volatility, I have a slight problem in timing my purchase. Although I always hold it for long period. When I say I, I mean a general consumer. So the price rise in a sense is good for the consumers. But immediately the volatility that we are seeing is not very good. And where this price is going to lead is also something which no one can say because it's still in dollar terms, it is not at the lifetime high. But in rupee terms, it is already at high time high. So if you assume there is still some headroom in dollar terms, then there is much more headroom in rupee terms. And the rate increases seem not to have been done away with, so there is still some more to come. So we don't know, that is again a headwind for gold, but when the rates are increased, what happens to rupee dollar is another factor. So there are a complex uh, interaction of forces now, but underlying uh, theme seems to be everybody is now very bullish on gold. Uh, we are talking to various investors, so it looks like we are in a good place as far as the price is concerned. And uh, maybe it is a good time to buy as well. And there are various ways to buy, by the way, because we are looking at sovereign gold bonds doing quite well. 100 tons already in the pocket there. Digital gold seems to be picking up as well, even though it's a very small market. But there are increase in numbers, as the industry tells us. Physical buying, of course, as you said, will continue to top, uh, lose the rule there. Uh, how are you looking at this market going forward then? Uh, which way do you think industry will bend on? Well, the industry uh, is actually relying a lot on physical jewellery and that too on wedding jewellery. Actually, if you really, uh, you know, parse this industry's uh, activities, it is relying heavily on weddings and physical jewellery. Now, probably one of the reasons why even exports are not, because we are not looking at the fashions outside. Uh, I am talking about exports of gold. So, Industry will continue to uh, do the wedding jewellery. I don't see much change in the industry's thought process or in the innovations that are coming through. Of course, there are lightweight jewelries and things like that coming through, but I can't now put my finger on one, that one big idea in the gold industry which has just changed the fashion in recent times. Uh, when it comes to the other things like uh, bars and coins, etc., I believe that if there is a slight stability in price or if consumers start believing okay it is going to be around the 60,000 range it's okay one two thousand here or there you may see a lot of them going into accumulation plans because 62,000 is a lot of money I mean it's not like I mean I, and I just look back 2019 it was 32,000 or 33,000 it's gone up to 60,000 I said uh, how many people's incomes would have gone up twice you know it's so difficult so it is going to be probably more of accumulation and it is better done through digital and other means rather than through large-scale jeweler schemes because large-scale jeweler schemes still have counterparty risk. So we should see, uh, which is where the EGRs and all could play a part as the prices rise, we could see uh, those becoming a lot more relevant. But for that, there is definitely a, f a kind of a force required. How far are we away from EGRs really becoming so big? Well, it is, a, I would say, the last leg of it, but it's a very difficult last leg, I would say. Uh, uh, you know, it is the GST part. Uh, I think SEBI is ready with the systems and vaulting. Everything is there. The GST exemption on the bars, which are dematerialized, I think is a point that has to be discussed because there are obviously some controls required, etc. But if that comes through and the EGRs become a reality, I think we could have some interesting developments in India on the investment front. 
Som, there also has been a lot of conversation about on how uh, refining is to, there are concerns about the duty size that India has, the discount that India plays on in sense of the gold prices. Uh, a lot of more support is required from the banks, from the Commerce Ministry perhaps, the RBI also. Do you see these rules, regulations change in favor of India anytime soon? You see, it is, um, I think when it comes to gold, what I have realized it, um, is that we will, in the next five years, I can't say when it will happen, in the next five years, the general uh, in, uh, growth in the economy will drive us to do certain things about rupee, floating rupee, you know, mm. more uh, relaxation of Opening capital controls, etc., mm. which will make uh, gold a collateral benefit, you know. Now, at what stage is it going to happen is difficult. Today, when we say, why is gold export not allowed? Well, in a sense, if you ask any trader, discount is great. I'll buy and sell somewhere else. But in India, you can't do it because you're stuck within this. Now, why are you are not able to do it? Because you're not able to export it. Now, you could, IIBX is trying to say, let exports happen through us. But all this, if you really look back, it is because we have currency controls, okay, which is for the right reasons. So in my view, I think many of the controls we are talking about now are likely to be, uh, to have a natural expiry in the next couple of years. And that is where the gold industry has to be prepared. And this is why I am very optimistic about IIBX as well. Okay. All right. All right, it was a great quarter and a lot of things expected going forward as well. Among one is the opening up of the market and, of course, the demand which we still are watching out for. So, thank you as always for joining us. Thank you for being part of this. And that's all the time that we have on Commodity Champions. Thank you for watching.